Hello, everyone. We hope you've all had a pleasant, beautiful day so far. I am Mohammed Musa, a member of the ARCNO team. We were established in 2016 in the University of Petra in Amman, Jordan. Since then, we have organized over 120 events for designs and architecture, students and enthusiasts. Our motto is aspire to inspire. And here to inspire us today is a special guest, an amazing architect. Today we have Nader Tahrani. Welcome. Before we begin our lecture, I would like to introduce two architects that graduated from the University of Petra, architect Omar Uthman and architect Russia. They will be joining our discussion today. Please welcome Nader Tahrani and the mic is all yours. Thank you. Um, does my mic work? I have my earphones on. There you go. I got it. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to join you. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to possibly jump around from time to time. I, I think uh, the situation is uh, fluid enough that we can ask questions in case you want me to stop along the way. Uh, but uh, the lecture is modeled after a brief and short manifesto I wrote for the plan, which talks about our design methodologies and some of the ways in which architects work in general. And, and, and one of those tends to be top down uh, with the idea of figuration uh, establishing certain primacies. Uh, and by figuration, uh, I'm referring to typological thinking or shaping of buildings uh, or sculpting of buildings. The idea of a, a clear figure within which one places spaces. And configurative thinking, on the other hand, is, is bottom-up thinking, where the architect is not necessarily obsessed with the image of the building or its iconic status, but rather the makeup of systems within that building, the relationship of parts. And we put, uh, let's say, an undue attention on configurative thinking, not so much because we're not interested in figuration, but because we are interested in a parity between those two that, for us, defines the discipline. Um, historically, if you look at the Iranian uh, tradition, uh, going all the way back to the Seljuk period, the Safavi period, and the Qajar period, there's an interesting emergence of a discourse that defines the relationship between structure and ornament, whereby in the Seljuk period, there is a, an absolute integral relationship between the two. In the Safavid period, they are disjointed, yet both structural. And by the time you get to the Rajar period, the ornament, the image, as it were, is merely pasted onto the structure. It is an absolute skin. In contemporary terms, of course, this is not so scandalous as most buildings are somehow rain screen systems and curtain wall systems, but it's interesting to be able to place this within our own uh, legacy and heritage uh, and understand the ways in which these have defined an ethos and a, a, a modality of thinking uh, but also to underscore the idea that ornament uh, is, is certainly not only not a crime, but is an indispensable protagonist in the construction of an idea. If that were meant to define an idea that would be alien to the West, uh, it's far from it. In fact, if you think of the elaborate uh, brickworks uh, of the Roman era in the antiquities, uh, it is not meant to uh, assign the image of the building. In fact, it was an underlayment for the marble, but more importantly, the formwork for the concrete that was poured within it. So there too, uh, the brick plays a kind of role of a vessel. Not to uh, forget that, you know, works of concrete, for instance, you know, have an invisible but performative core, that is the the, uh, the, the rebar that gives it a, its lateral flexibility. So as you look at 
the history of masonry, what we're so obsessed with in our earlier projects, uh, we realize uh, the many histories that have impacted its thinking uh, and why uh, we were led to such ex explorations from Jefferson to Eladio Dieste to Leverance. All of these uh, uh, perform a certain narrative and yet they fall short of something and somehow to those. But first, uh, a foray into how is it that we as architects build? Because we all know that fundamentally architects don't build. They draw that are the prerequisite for construction itself. But somehow that has made itself into the law such that in the US at least, architects are responsible for the design intent and the means and methods is held solely in the hands of the contractors. And part of this talk is all about the political importance of architects taking hold of the means and methods if they wish to construct a productive relationship between configurative and figurative uh, strategies. So in this first project that we did many, many years ago, I've had to redraw it again in relationship to new modalities of representation. We were interested in working with local materials found in Venezuela uh, with bricks, blocks and tiles to produce what was a, ostensibly a simple house an L configuration and plan with a sidewall that gave a kind of screen in relationship to the neighbors. Uh, the key was how to build this screen and we were already thinking about a corbeling strategy whereby the brick would evolve through a folding process much like the undulating walls you see in Virginia and in Uruguay but this time folding to give it lateral stability. Now Going back to the topic of figuration and configuration, on the left side, you can appreciate the, the, the kind of sculpted figure of zoomorphic elements within the context of that brick, but you also recognize that they're completely alien to the image of the brick or the functionality of the brick. They are an image cast into it or sculpted out of it. On the right, there are, and one could argue there are an equal amount of apparitions uh, in the configuration of the brick, but that if they are, they are dedicated to the grain, the tectonic grain of the brick itself. And of course, we know that the grain of the brick is not meaningless, that uh, let's say the dead men in the Flemish bond are giving lateral stability, uh, much like uh, the kinds of uh, dead men that we use in retaining walls. And so this house benefits from this kind of configurative thinking because this is what leads to its transformation of the blocks and what we call the variable bond. The variable bond is neither a running bond nor a Flemish bond, but the variability allows it to expand and contract. Here's the plan. Uh, and essentially by contracting, give this, uh, uh, curtain wall, as it were, to the right to frame La Roca, the rock that is uh, in the back of this building. Keep in mind that this was designed, conceived, and draw, drawn in the period before the, the computer uh, came to be and the advent of computation. And so we actually had to draw this as we all would have in some day and era, but think parametrically. And part of the task was to imagine how to introduce not only lateral stability by folding the wall, but introducing through the expansion of the bonding system, the advent of light and air into that very same space. And so this load bearing wall goes from a load bearing condition to a very thin, uh, attenuated veil through which light and, uh, and air uh, is able to travel. Essentially, this describes what we would call in geometry 
a developable surface, a ruled surface pixelated by corbeling up, uh, you know, a, an eighth of an inch at a time to create this gauze-like veil whose bonding is effectively defined by the logic of, um, of the fold itself. Thought through parametrically, we, we could redraw this in accordance with numerics, free from the graphic visualization that was the conception of this thing in the first instance. And so as we move from rhino modeling, uh, and went into scripting processes, we were able to effectively retool this to be able to expand, contract, and give different dimensionalities to essentially the same project. This is now 20 years later, working as effectively with the same project, but imagining different constraints being projected onto it. So as I conclude on this introduction, there, there are really two modalities uh, of thought being exposed here. One is exemplified by the thumbprint, where the print of the thumb uh, is really the visualization of our identity. And you can verify it. In other words, if you uh, took a photograph of my thumb, you would see exactly that imprint. And that is a direct image of my identity. In the barcode, there is no visual link uh, between that thumbprint and my identity. It merely recalls that identity through numerical terms. And that shift in representation is fundamental to this contemporary era because we've uh, essentially uh, rethought composition through code in the first instance with significant possibilities of visualization in the second. Um, are there any questions before I go on? No, I'm good. You can continue. Good. So naturally, as you look at the brick construction, it recalls figurations that are quite familiar and in, in a way part of our uh, sense of being in the world, the curtain, uh, as an animate uh, artifact that reacts to the wind it is somehow here petrified into the concrete uh, uh, rendition uh, of that being built in brick. That image in and of itself is transferable to other uh, materials, but not without transformation. So consider this curtain wall that produces this shroud uh, allowing for a stair to connect the living room and the garden using corrugated metal. How does that work? Well, effectively, we know that corrugation is rigid, structurally rigid on the vertical axis, but also figurally malleable on the horizontal. This enables it to distort without any consequences to its fabrication. We know this is possible because the line at the top of the corrugation is exactly the same length as the line at the bottom of the corrugation. And this is the definition of a ruled surface, which is the proof of the theorem. The fact that straight lines can be connected from any point on the top to the bottom line is almost a proof of its uh, constructability. And so these principles are what came to bear on us as we got our first project, a project of about 6,000 square feet for which there was about $205,000 worth of construction. Um, the problem was when we did the drawings for this vessel, this uh, hookah den, um, we got from the contractor a budget 
uh, something around $170,000 just to build that. And we didn't understand why. And that left us only $30,000 to renovate the entire rest of the structure. It didn't make sense. So we decided to make a mock-up inside of our own office, stacking plywood layer by layer from a drawing that we ourselves had made, hanging a plumb bob from the top down, and realized that we could make seven layers of these per day and probably make it within 30 days for about $30,000, leaving about $175,000 for construction of the rest of the restaurant. And by doing this, we co-opted that scope of work. We internalized it within our office. And by doing that, we're able to build this structurally rigid frame of the space uh, within which this lounge occurs. Um, again, uh, this is effectively the same system as uh, the project uh, of, um, um, uh, of the brick corbeling in, uh, in Venezuela. And finally, we also got to build a rendition of this in China uh, for a concrete wall, which is in a seismic zone of a campus for the Tongxian Art Center, where the gatehouse uh, served as the basis for the exploration of this expanded bonding system with a gateway that takes you in uh, to the campus, but also as you get inside of it, an ascent pattern with a figure eight circulation that takes you up the building, revealing the concrete that is the core of the building, uh, but much like uh, the Roman concept that I showed you before, using brick as the formwork for the laying of, uh, of that concrete. And so here we appreciate the idea that brick is not functioning to hold up the building. Uh, it is there merely as a malleable scaffolding that is able to shape the building, the figure of its roof tilting for the uh, projection of water, but also the excavation of the brick to vent the building and its mechanical systems. But you can see that the brick, even at the level of the ceiling, is there to hold up the concrete, which is doing the structural work in a, uh, in, in a seismic zone of some considerable measure. So we go to chapter two now, and um, uh, a moment in time that we entered into the economic uh, doom of 2008, uh, where there was the major recession. We did about 12 competitions and happened to win three of them. And all three were schools of architecture. Sequentially, the Georgia Tech project on the left, the Melbourne um, School of Design in the center, and the Toronto University of Toronto um, uh, expansion of the School of Architecture. Within this lay a, an obsession about structure and the ways in which suspended structures operate. So we're operating within the mindset of CISA uh, in Lisbon, uh, of Khan in Venice, and his desire to inhabit the, the space of the truss uh, over the canals. And of course, of Gaudi, to imagine that the shaping of buildings has a direct relationship with the structural performance at work and how to bring these into conversation through computational means to make for extraordinary structures where part to whole relationships uh, are deemed significant. And in this case, our explorations ended up with this installation at the Boston Society of Architects uh, headquarters, working with a compressive uh, system of vaulting in tension. So uh, instead of the keystoning of an arch, we had a series of puzzle pieces that would be locked into each other and by virtue of that locking, that keystoning process, as it were, 
they enable a, uh, a suspension that is light on, one, uh, uh, on the one hand as a structure, it's a, it's a dense uh, foam, but also something that you can stand on when you're up on top of it, almost like a boat. And these explorations that we're doing as pieces of research have a direct relationship with the buildings that we're doing. In this case, the Melbourne School of Design has a larger and vaster set of missions. What is the design studio of the future? What is it, the academic environment in the stage, in the era of interdisciplinarity? What is a living building when you're trying to make ecology uh, and ecological performance a priority? And what is a building uh, for a school of architecture when you know it's a didactic instrument, when it's built pedagogy itself? In the context of the Melbourne School of Design, we were designing within an urban context of Neo-Georgian courtyards for a new site at the core of the campus surrounded by a series of important public spaces, a mat building that is so deep that it required in and of itself its own internal courtyard that would become the space of collection of all of its people. And this is a very significant moment because this atrium was meant at first anyway to be a general lobby bringing everybody together. But the original conception of this building were actually quite different. The idea was that we would be able to afford a studio space at the top of the building that would oversee the entire campus and all of the different departments would work their way up to the studio, something that was value engineered out of the project within the first month. And so our mission was not to lose the studio, but to transfer it into a slightly widened circulatory space that brought all of the programs from architecture to landscape to urbanism and construction into conversation through the studio space itself. And then enabling them to leak out into the research exhibit classroom spaces, uh, adopting and usurping their spaces as needed. So conceptually, as you look at the edge of the atrium on the left side, you can begin to appreciate the ground, which is the social space, level one, where you have collaborative spaces, level two, where you have your laptops and drafting spaces, and then level three, where you have the seats for the crit spaces. All of these things are happening in tandem and somehow uh, effectively engaging the very programs within the depth of them. As an urban proposition, uh, it is a building in the round. And so uh, we activate the main entry from Swanston Street with a new green uh, on the south side. We create a new courtyard between the Elizabeth Murdoch building and a new street that goes within our building uh, to the opposite side. A piano nobile on the first floor connects our new public space with the engineering building to the northeast. We deliver, uh, even our back door is exposed to the open to where the fab lab is, to the north where we build out a lot of the uh, mock-ups uh, uh, of what's happening in the uh, fab lab. And finally, the concrete lawn connects our building to the student union, which is a major hub for the entire campus. And so the way that the ground comes into conversation with the Piano Nobile sets up a dual condition of public entry activated by both the people of the school as well as the people that are going through the school. Uh, this is not just a building, it is a landscape to be navigated. And so at the base of the building, while you're navigating through, you're coming across not only the library, the fab lab and the exhibi exhibition space, but also all of the auditoria that are used by the entire campus. And then the Piano Nobile becomes the new foundation for the design school itself, one layer up. And in that street, you look up into that atrium space and begin to identify an iconic uh, piece 
that is at the center. This uh, totemic object speaks to the history of other totems that uh, help build this discussion about the figurative and the configurative space uh, of operation. In the, the Tempietto, you appreciate the ideal circumstances of the temple with the kind of varied context that serves as its frame. Uh, that actually is just a folly. It's a miniature piece of architecture uh, that uh, is out of scale with the city, but is a, a test to, uh, for the dome in St. Peter's. Uh, on the right, you see maybe uh, Gary, one of Gary's best buildings and the, the zoomorphic figure contained within a very neutral framework. Uh, but in the center, you see Khan attempting to reconcile the totemic individuality of what is actually a banal staircase with the configurative logic of the structural system of the building at large. And so that dialogue that you see in Khan's building is something we're trying to expand on by building not from the ground up, but from the sky down. And so here, by spanning the building 22 meters in deep LVLs, and then coffering them laterally, we're able to bring light in there without any direct sun. Massive beams that are about three, four meters deep. And then instead of building from the ground up, we suspend the dedicated studios from that roof all the way down just before it touches the ground. And herein lies a tectonic logic of rustication that is inverted from the expected. In other words, we take the massive pieces of wood at the top, and by the time that you get to the bottom, you are veneering them into tensile um, laminates of plywood that in a way reveal themselves both on the surface as well as in the depth of the structure and the skin. You can see the mass of the volume of the structure at the top, and uh, the fabrication of that is all done off-site and brought to the site at four or five o'clock in the morning and installed in a very limited time. The spaces are literally carved out of that volume and that mass. But by the time you get to the bottom, you get to appreciate the thinness of that very veneer, uh, its acoustic uh, resonance on the surface, but also the flakes at the bottom that gives for a very, uh, fine acoustic environment on the ground as it thins out at the base. And the performance of this building, of course, is not just visual. It is, uh, has to do with its daylighting, it has to do with its um, uh, acoustics, and the way it behaves is through and throughout. If the ideal circumstances of this building have to do with the invention of a vertical studio space, one would think that it would succeed but strangely enough, its failure is that it has brought in so many people from the rest of the campus that the designers can rarely get seats in their own building. And so this has become a, a, uh, a, a, uh, a tricky point for this building. So going back to the main theme of figuration and configuration, a dumb diagram explains how this works. The bowl and the nest are effectively the same thing. Uh, the bowl, uh, is a vessel that contains things. Uh, it, it has aggregates in it. It has molecules. It has pieces, but they're smoothed out. So uh, your eye only sees the figure of the bowl. The nest underscores the importance of the constituent elements that go into the making of the nest. The twig, the blade of grass, uh, the, the rubble from the ground. All of them conspire to make for the vessel that becomes the home for the eggs. Uh, the reality is that all of you know that there are many different kinds of nests. And the beauty of that for an architect is that we can speculate different morphologies as a consequence of that. And the detail is a central part of that. So as one looks at a construction site with a, a mass or a rubble of rebar, uh, we tend to ask, what can we build with this? and how can we advance structural knowledge through it. And so when we were given the task to span over 
the highway that connects the Yarra River to the Rod Laver uh, Tennis Stadium in Melbourne, we thought to ourselves, what would be a, a way in which we could take rebar and instead of making large structural elements, through redundancy, how to weave a filigree of rebar, both longitudinally and laterally, bending them together, twisting them together to conspire to make a long span structure. Effectively, a filigree that is woven in both axes. Now consider this, the maximum moment being at the center of a span produces what we call the bow string truss. And usually that's composed of massive elements. But as you look at the left side, you can also appreciate the thinness with which some of those tensile elements might work. And so we're working with both rebar and ten tensile elements to give depth and weight at the same time to this fifth facade that happens in the gardens below it. You're not just occupying the top of the bridge in dialogue with the skyline of the city. What seems more important is how the rebar wraps around not only from the lights, but all the way to the belly and reveals an underworld, which is the real place uh, of this park. So the city matters to us, uh, and this extends to our preoccupations with the city of Toronto, uh, the edge of the University of Toronto being defined by the Spadina Circle, where Knox College um, anchored the south side uh, uh, of the circle. Uh, something to be preserved and maintained through an addition of a studio space onto the north that would be sufficiently suppressed as to be able to frame the spire. All of the additions would come out in the form of landscape with urban spaces carved out of them to make for uh, fabrication spaces, library spaces, urban uh, research centers, effectively bringing together the idea of architecture, landscape, urbanism, and the design world all in one structure. Now, the Knox College is pretty simple. Uh, it was a U-shaped building with certain pavilions on either side. And to maintain the economy of costs, the project essentially was to complete it using the same logic and reinforcing it with a facade, historically the first of its kind in the north side, and finally the cores that activate the building on all four corners, and a courtyard which would serve as the grand hall, bringing everybody together in the core of the building while borrowing natural light from holes from the north and the south that bring light from the roof into the darkest area uh, of this building. While the north and the south facades are symbolically the most prominent, it's the east and the west that activate the building. It's an internal street, much like the Melbourne School, that is open 24-7 and is activated by lockers, by the uh, cafe, by the fab lab, by the photo rooms, and the great hall that's in the center. Even though it's a massive block, it's very much a landscape building horizontally engaging the north, the south, east, and west spaces to become an urbanistically motivated building. And so the street that happens on the inner core is also pointing in all directions, connecting you at the center, not only to the studios above, but also to Spadina North beyond. And that you have to look through the Fab Lab in order to see Spadina North is part of the structure and the organization of the building. As you back out of the building, you recognize that that space actually opens up with a huge garage door so you can build things on the outside. And that is your big connection to the city. That is not just a facade. It is a clerestory light that gives you indirect light to the studio spaces themselves. And so the notion of directionality is a central part of this. And the way that the morphology of the roof works is a way not only to span the space without columns, but to bring natural daylighting and organize the hydrology and the drainage of the building. So all of the 
a greenery of the site is irrigated with the water from the roof itself. Now, because this was challenged by the contractor, claiming that it couldn't be built or that it was too expensive, we explained this roof through precedence and the works of uh, people like Felix Candela. They said it's still a million dollars over budget. So what we did instead was that we built one of the leaves of this in our studio. And instead of designing formwork for the roof itself, we imagined what would it mean to build it out of metal, to stop the concrete on the third floor and build a metal roof. And by doing so, break down the geometries as efficiently as possible so that we could save some eight hundred thousand dollars by doing that we were also able to insert a laminar layer of chipboard that that served as a radiant panel meaning that the heating happened in the ground but the cooling happened in the radiant panel above and by doing this essentially abstracting the roof as a plaster layer, we're able to bring these two environmental systems into dialogue and uh, to sandwich the studio space in between. Now, the logic of this extension is not to mimic the identity of the old building. Really, what we draw from the Gothic is an idea of the attenuated and an idea of the silhouette. And in this case, the silhouette of our building its undulations come from the performance of these skylights into the downspout crevices and into the irrigation of the site at large. So uh, I want to take a slight brief moment to also explain the tensions between figurative and configurative reading, taking you back to the discussion, discussion of tectonics by way of structure and ornament. In Western culture, uh, there is uh, always a theoretical tension between structure and ornament and a morality that is associated with it. If you go back to the Greeks and the ways in which people have conceptualized uh, the orders of architecture, you appreciate the way in which the triglyphs, those three little elements, are an embodiment, a manifestation of the wooden beams that span the temple. And so it's logical that they would do that, except, of course, that you know that the triglyphs are in stone and the members are in wood. So somewhere within the architectural imagination, it has become kosher, acceptable, that the petrification of raw matter is part of the suspension of disbelief in architecture. We all understand that it, the ornament is not really the structure, it's a representation of that structure. But what's weird is that when it turns the corner, we know it cannot be spanning in the same way. And so we realize all of a sudden that maybe it is not the structure that's holding up the building at all. It is the ornament that is the essence and the structure is there to uphold that. So in all of these projects that I'm showing you, there is this constant tension between the reality of raw matter and how it operates uh, as a representational field. And this is true in the Adams Library. And I'll try to go fast through the Adams Library because it's a, the plan is almost formless. It's tripartite based on the adults, the uh, adolescents and the kids and their three different areas. Uh, as an urban phenomena, we're trying to create a large stoa structure on Main Street composed of effectively a monumental pitch that is at the scale of the temple uh, 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 of the Main Street, while the diminution of those same roof lines in the back alley to begin to speak to the scale of the smaller houses. The roof of this project, much like the bridge in Melbourne, is its fifth facade. You can see it from all of the neighboring structures and therefore the shape of the roof and its surface are super important. Here, a, an unrolled surface of the Doric column forms the undulations of the Western facade, a monolithic and large scale civic um, canvas on one side 
uh, here under construction. And on the opposite side, uh, a kind of uh, morphing of that surface into individual units corresponding to rooms and a way of irrigating the site to uh, a back alley where the water mitigation occurs um, to the east, again, under construction. So in fact, this fifth facade is also performative. It is uh, an, an, on active duty engaging into the irrigation of this thing, as much as the south facade is working with the sun to mitigate uh, the entry of light during the southern months and allowing them inside for the winter months to gain as much heat uh, as possible. Something unique to the American uh, construction and architectural culture are what are called brick-sided structures, which are incredibly opportunistic and pragmatic at the same time. Uh, buildings that are not composed of a single technology or a monolithic material, but that sur surreptitiously adopt wood and brick coming together as if they were wallpaper or clapboard and stone doing the same thing. And usually uh, somewhere between fire protect protection or the mitigation of costs, you can begin to see this pragmatism roll itself out. And this, and this building is very much part of that using the white scallop panels for the front where the civic uh, front is. And as you get to the back side of the structure, almost like a Greek urn, we use dark black eggplant panels as well as terracotta panels to begin to absorb some of the masonry history of Boston within the logic of, uh, of these panels themselves. So uh, coming together, all of this forms uh, itself around a large reading garden to the north where this existing oak tree is saved by our team. So putting this all together also, uh, that fifth facade has a sixth facade that is the exposed beams that gives body and shape to the mechanical uh, sprinkler and illumination systems, which are all part of the identity of the inside of the library. Bringing it all together, you can begin to appreciate the mat plan a monolithic plan that establishes the primacy of the front facade, the breakdown of the back in accordance with the promenade that goes towards the rear and the mitigation of water, the way in which the water is forced in one direction only, how a courtyard is carved out of the south to bring maximum light into the core of the building, shaping the court for the, the tree in the north. And then finally, the logic of the grain of the bookshelves on the interior running north-south, only to radicalize the exposure of the beams on the interior, interior running east-west, weaving them together in dialogue. And so as one navigates the core of the building, one is inhabiting the tectonic grain of the structure at once within the shelves and the rippled beams overhead framing the view of the oak towards the north. And so uh, this project recalls some of our older experiments uh, in uh, the bank restaurant where uh, the identity of the project had to do with the embodiment of the mechanical, structural, and wine room systems, and the floor was relatively open for manipulation. So as I go into my last project, there is this same preoccupation with uh, notions of folded roofs and how they operate. So permit me in um, introducing Villa Varroise, uh, as the one project where we're dealing not with aggregate form, but uh, liquid form. I mean, concrete is a form of link liquid whose identity is either formed by the, uh, the pouring of an element into formwork or the post-production work uh, 
uh, that's rendered onto it. It's essentially a landscape project, a house that is built into the earth and protected from its neighbors. Uh, morphologically, it, it is a courtyard building, but it adapts its geometry to the site for maximum views, not only towards the Mediterranean, but also to the west and the Pinus Pinae trees. It is not a flat site, and therefore the tilting of the site gains it better views by way of the courtyard dipping on one side so that both levels get the great views with a swimming pool on, on center. And most importantly, hinging together at the two corners, the stair two staircases connected to itself, allowing the landscape to be able to run through it, over it, uh, and embedded within it. This is effectively also a landscape project. And so that front facade is not actually a facade at all. It is a beam. It's a concrete beam within which a few holes have been allowed. The interior is characterized by a very simple living room, like a case study house, that opens out onto the Mediterranean on one side, but also spans longitudinally as folded concrete roofs begin to show the western face of the building where the Pinus Pinae are located. From the courtyard, you're protected from your neighbors, but can leak out from underneath your own building. And essentially the entry into that precinct is revealed here in this sequence of slides as you enter from the driveway and begin to go up through the core of the building and then up uh, into the inner sanctum where essentially uh, you see the pool and the views uh, towards the Mediterranean and beyond. Explorations in concrete work uh, have been many throughout the years and from people like Fizak to more contemporary works with fabric form work, we thought of two modalities within which to do our concrete work. One is a kind of digital script where fabric form concrete works with in relationship to jigs where the rustication that we want to project onto this gives it a, a kind of rubble-like configuration uh, imprinted on the wall itself. Although this was somehow too representational in our minds, we asked ourselves what would it mean if we work with the aggregate itself in the way that Rafael Moneo did in, in uh, uh, um, uh, San Sebastian or what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did in Arizona, there, where the rocks become monolithic monumental aggregates within it. In our case, the smoothness of the aggregate on the inside of the building can yield slightly larger pieces of aggregate as you go up the hill and as that same wall becomes in fact a stone wall with the concrete serving as mortar just holding it together in a typical French retaining wall fashion as you zoom out of it. This uh, is, uh, in a way, a, a more correct representation of the intention of how that was to, to transform. In reality, we had to uh, scope back and use the grain of the wood by sandblasting it out and the coloring of the concrete comes from the color of the earth itself. Uh, and that grain that you see is a representation of our interests in the way in which architects manufacture grain. When we look at nature, we take grain for granted and therefore zebra stripes is a way to camouflage it within the, uh, the this savanna. But once you look closer at the zebra, you know that something is wrong because everybody knows that the zebra's grain runs perpendicular to the torso, but also the legs. And the architecture of it is in turning of the corners. But architects fabricate architectures and the theories for those architectures and the theories of compositions. And so we never do what the brick wants to do. We actually uh, coerce it to do things that we wanted to do. So in that context, uh, we're operating in a sphere of, of artifice. Uh, and this is 
somehow uh, the world in which we're operating in, both at the scale of architecture as well as the scale of furniture, where butcher board technology is called on to gain traction with quarter sawn walnut and zebra wood, turning corners and speaking to the architecture of the grain in tandem. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm happy to, to take questions um, should you have any. First of all, thank you so much for such an enlightening interesting and uh, the idea that whenever a contractor tells you that something is not going to work, that between you and your team, you come up with a solution at your own studio and to prove that any architect can come up with a solution just to make the design right is very impressive actually. And uh, we have some questions that we are already prepared for you that we're going to ask you. But before anything, I'm, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is uh, Omar Osman. I'm an architect from Jordan and graduated from Petra University in 2016. And uh, since then, I've been practicing architecture mostly as a freelance architect. So uh, let's start with the first question. I'm going to read it for you and see your viewpoint on it. Uh, you said in uh, one of your statements and lectures that it doesn't matter what a building material is built of, but it matters that it means something. Uh, can you elaborate that and give us a more general idea of what that statement means to you and the certain message that you try to deliver to everyone who sees your architecture and your work and how you can communicate with the residents of the buildings through the material that you choose and why you choose such materials for such projects? Well, I, I think that statement was probably made in response to uh, a challenge to authorship. There are many ar architects who maybe have a misplaced emphasis on developing a personal style, a, a, a signature, or a materiality for which they're known. And, and I've gained an, an appreciation for certain types of architects, among them, very different ones, but all consistent in this one attribute, Saarinen, Eero Saarinen, uh, Herzog and de Meron, Monet, Moneo, whose buildings are not an embodiment of a style, but rather a reaction to a particular culture, context, or situation. And therefore, the materials are not somehow, um, they're not willful from the position of authorship. They're willful from how they emerge in conversation with a context and how they respond to that context. Now, where that uh, establishes meaning is also important because some buildings uh, acquire meaning, meaning by being, being an extension of that context. And so their confluence of materiality uh, uh, makes them more anonymous. And some uh, buildings that form contrast with that context objectify the building, let's say if the building is a civic structure and requires uh, the kind of autonomy that, and, and a mon that a monument may require. So that meaning is at once strategic and enters the building into what I would call the social contract of a public conversation. That, it, that, that the building no longer belongs to the architect, it belong, belongs to a collective. And, and meaning is very much something that we can't project as individuals onto a building. Meaning is publicly derived we come to a consensus about the syntax uh, of language. Language evolves over time based on common usages and transformations of that language. And so I like to think that uh, the meaning of a building is not also not inherent. It is something that is subject to a negotiation uh, of, of receptivity through uh, a public out there. 
Okay. Um, and I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, I have noticed that most of the things that you do are so innovative. And uh, I have been hearing the term bio biomimicry architecture a lot these days. What, what did you hear? What's the term? The term of uh, biomimicry architecture. I see. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, have you worked on such projects that involve studying parts of uh, like, let's say, plants or animals or anything related to that subject and worked on it and come up with something so innovative, just like your past designs? Look, as you look at the animations that we've done, as you look at uh, some of the metaphors that we've done, you see yeah. the, uh, the, the, the presence, uh, the geometries, and the insinuations of nature everywhere. But I've also been very careful to say that we are actually not emulating nature. Uh, what is powerful about architecture is the artifice uh, that we build into it. So all of this is, uh, is, 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 if you like, learning from uh, triggers and, and uh, lessons from nature. But what we're doing to nature is nothing less than radical. So uh, what we did to this image is nothing less than heretical. This is an absolute farce. And this too is an absolute farce. The majority of our buildings are a testing of verisimilitude, that which uh, arrives uh, at believability, even though it requires the suspension of disbelief. So, uh, and, I, and I think behind all of this is also a, a kind of ideological um, uh, imposition of morality on, on architecture, that if you're true to structure, then it must be good. If you're uh, uh, copying nature, then it must be true or something like that. Uh, and I think what I've tried to emphasize is is somehow that speculative architecture, architectures that uh, are willing to fail and are willing to risk, uh, are achieved through a test and failure model, much like Fizak and, uh, and others have been able to do. Uh, these come from your ability to absorb the failures of nature as much as the, the way in which they're, they're built up. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave the mic now to my colleague, Russia, and she is going to ask you further questions. Please. Well, first, it's a privilege to have you here with us. Thank you for such a presentation. It was so rich. Uh, my question goes like, uh, what are the aspects we need to keep in mind before we start the process of folding the skin and thinking about its materials? Uh, could you ask that again? I was interrupted by an urgent no. text. What are the what? What are the aspects we need to keep in mind before we start the process of folding the skin and thinking about its material? Well, look, uh, we are we are we are defined by our budgets, the availability of materials, mm -hmm. uh, and our ethics. To the extent that you believe that you can get a material that's cheaper from China uh, than from Amman or Petra or somewhere near you, you have a profound dilemma in today's world because world economies have made it such that it sometimes is cheaper to get a material from thousands and thousands of miles away than something that's closer to you. Uh, using an embodied energy that is so high that it compromises the very choice that you've made in the first instance. These are difficult and challenging questions. But I, I don't think there's one single answer to your question. We, we select materials and, and modes of fabrication in dialogue with urbanism and the con contextual triggers that 
motivate your ability to converse with the city. We uh, select materials uh, calling on the history of a culture and the ways in which that materiality is being transformed in the contemporary and the modern era. We adopt materials in conversations that are at once in debates happening globally, like you and I are having right now, but also locally. And so your ability to negotiate the local and the global uh, dialogue is as important. Uh, and then finally, labor. You may be able to design the ultimate state-of-the-art digital building, but what if the local labor doesn't accept that? What if they build a certain way? How do you hybridize your thinking to work with state-of-the-art equipment and local uh, uh, contingencies at the same time? And sometimes we can do more innovative things by looking at uh, the crafts market of a local area that can radicalize certain things that you couldn't in a developed some, uh, country, let's say. So for instance, I give you an example. I couldn't have done this building in America. Not affordable, not able to be crafted, not anything. But what I was scared most is that they would get the craft wrong. But I was the wrong one. Because in China, laying brick is like breathing air. They've done it for hundreds and hundreds of years. I needed to give no directions on this. They understood perfectly how to do this within zero tolerances. So they were very comfortable with these kinds of operations that I'm showing you. So being able to understand the role of labor as part of the selection of materials, I think is a central part of it. The elimination of trades is another part of it. In other words, if a normative building has a, a skin, a, a waterproofing, a core, an interior plaster, and you know, uh, acoustic isolation, what of these four traits can I eliminate to begin to draw out both the budget and the performance of the building? Often, uh, it's about, uh, uh, excuse the metaphor, killing two birds or three birds with one stone. Like, what are some raw strategies where the raw structure can be made to perform the way you want it to perform? That uh, is what this roof is. This is not a finished roof. This is the raw structure of your roof itself. And that same thing is true for the roof uh, of, um, uh, of the Adams Library. What is happening right now in, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I, I don't have the, the, the finished scenes, but these are all, None of this is finished lumber. This is all raw structure uh, being manifest uh, in those ceilings. So to the extent that material selection is strategic, it's also an understanding that what is too much, what is not enough, and how can I edit myself? Okay. Uh, according to the Melbourne University main course, uh, main court case that you've mentioned before, what are the advantages of creating a visual connection between different departments? Such a common space. I'll say that again. About the Melbourne uh, University main court case that you've mentioned, uh, yeah. what are the advantages of creating a visual connection between different departments in such a common space? So uh, this requires a little bit more explanation. I didn't do a good job of that, but let's go in section. The reality, let's see if I can do this. The reality is that because uh, exhibitions happens on this level and crit spaces and then collective model making and conferencing happens on this level and then drawing happens on this level and then more critting happens on this level it means that 
all students are constantly going up and down this for doing different functions. But as they go up and down, they're mixing in with the PhD crowd here. Then they're mixing in with the master's program here. Then they're mixing in with the undergraduate program here. And on the opposite side, they're mixing in with the um, construction uh, crew there. Uh, and then they're mixing in with uh, the landscape department there, et cetera. And then the urbanism is right underneath that. So the notion is that you don't uh, identify and segregate these departments. You place them in places that you're bound to cross each other in the promenade. That uh, is more prone to create interdisciplinarity because all of these people are somehow crossing each other's paths no matter which direction that they're going in. So it's in the cross-pollination of this space that uh, we have placed our bets. Everybody is somehow uh, making some trajectory of circulation that is helping to identify uh, one group with another through serendipity. Uh, I'll leave it up to my colleague, Omer, for the next question. Okay, so uh, the next question is, looking into the new technologies and computer programs that generate wide range of different forms and shapes to solve single problem, how to create the right meaning and design through that process? Well, I mean, I, I make reference to that earlier when I talk about the difference in in composition and uh, and um, and uh, coding. You know, I mean, imagine that for you know over five hundred years, you're uh, you're you're composing paintings, you're inventing perspective. You're inventing the axonometric or oblique views, but all of these, all of these advances are rooted in concepts of visuality. All of them require the eye to essentially become the means through which new modalities of vision are constructed. Uh, here, all of a sudden, uh, the eye has become decentered. Uh, the eye does not exist in the code. It is an algorithm, right? Yes. Uh, and that, that algorithm produces, you know, different possible eventualities uh, that produce images. And so the eye comes back in there again as a critic to be able to uh, establish value, meaning, if you like, or strategy in the different versions through a critical engagement. But I think it's a different process. And so all of a sudden, uh, we have to learn new tools which are not about hand-to-eye coordination, uh, not about the modality of commands on Rhino or some other thing, but they have to do with uh, a different engagement with uh, information, data, and, uh, and theorems. Uh, but that's just one way uh, of beginning to engage uh, in technologies critically. Uh, that is not, necess not, not, necess not, not necessarily, not to reject them at all, but to understand their instrumentality. One of the reasons I showed this project in the first place uh, was to prove uh, one single phenomena that A, this is the most computationally motivated project that we've done. And yet this drawing that was done here was done 20 years later after the project had been designed. Uh, and that project had been designed effectively by uh, 
by this sketch here on site. I mean, that was the sketch on site. Then we got to the office and we drafted it up here. This is all pencil. But the thinking was already uh, uh, parametric in, in concept, even though it wasn't in, in, in action. And so understanding ways in which uh, a medium can lead thinking versus a medium can absorb thinking. And this is uh, a, kind of a, a contradictory narrative about how we came into technology. Obviously, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the break moment is this moment right here. Yes. Okay. Um, my second question is, uh, we all can see that technology has been evolving, especially with the coding and AI technology and stuff like that. Do you think that in the near future, that AI technology could take up the role of architects? I know it's a sensitive question because I, uh, most of architects or like all architects, before they work, they have that, uh, let's say, human feeling when designing, especially when, when they're con in contact with the client. They have to hear, they listen, they see the needs, and then they start with the design process. So do you think that since you are more into technology and design and coding, do you think that in the future this might happen? Like a client could sit with a computer, just type in a few words and inspirations, pick up some images, and the computer can code such thing? I have no doubt that practicing in 20 years will be very different than what you and I are doing now. Uh, I also have no doubt that AI will have an impact on how we compose and how we engage with each other. But this is also a reminder that everything I've shown you today, no matter what technology was adopted, also had to do with the critical faculties of synthesis and integration for which there is no model. For instance, if you take, let's say this is a design process that goes in this direction, I'm going to put a design process in there. But within that design process, there's questions of urbanism. Uh, there's questions of materiality. There's questions of programming. Uh, there's questions of building technologies. I'm talking about mechanical systems and, you know, just... Uh, not, not materiality as in the image of the building, but the technologies of the building, uh, uh, and other concepts like the, the, uh, the uh, architectural promenade or other devices that come into bear. As you design a building, you don't start with one of these and go to the other. You are doing all of these at the same time. So we're, we're designing a little bit all of these at the same time. Excuse me, these should have been down here as a list. Uh, I, I did them in the wrong uh, axis. As you're designing all of these, uh, a, as a process of design, uh, each of them are being designed in this axis a little bit together, and you're maybe developing them slightly differently with different sequences and different maturities. But at some point, they contradict each other, and you have to make major choices. Those choices are ideological. They're not automated. Why? Because they demonstrate bias. And the prejudice that is implicit within that makes for the worst and the best projects. Best when you get the, the projects, the, the bias right, and worse when you display the inhumanity, if you like, of the decision that you made. But those are because you're asking different questions of urbanism, materiality, programming, and building technologies. And they don't always come into confluence. They come into conflict as much. And so uh, I guess if I had to ask you about the future of the requisite impacts of AI, my biggest question is not about um, how 
it may help compose for us, but how it can discern judgment for us. You know, one of the most wonderful thing, and you, I'm sure you've all read this, right? As we think about uh, driverless cars and uh, its ability through its intelligence to identify obstacles. But already we've seen that some of these driverless cars have run over people. They make accidents also. But let's take the most intelligent system of a driverless car and it has to make a decision. Some accident happens elsewhere that forces this car to make a decision and it knows it either has to run over that person on the street to save the four lives in the car or it has to forego the lives of people in the car to save the life of the person out there on the street and it has to do that within a second or less than a second. The ethical dimension that comes into uh, the production of artificial intelligence has to do with the expansion of a discussion about the domain of ethics and how we program things in the first place. That to me is an interesting part of what we're doing here. And so what I like to discuss here is not structural determinism, nor programmatic determinism, you know, nor urbanistic thinking, but how these come into conversation with each other at a critical moment where something that you would never imagine uh, could happen, happens. And I think of our, I, th I think of the Adams Library as that, because it was so, the plan of this is so much the result of community interaction that an architect would never draw these plans. They, they happen to us, but we had to make sense of something that was designed by another type of authorship altogether. Uh, so I, I, I think that critical judgment and engagement and the domain of ethics is where the next uh, domain of, of questioning lies behind your question. Thank you so much for your answer. I'm going to leave the mic now for my colleague again. Okay, go ahead, Rasha. Hi, okay, thank you. Uh, for my next question is, as Dean of Cooper Union, do you think the current architecture model of education could be able to fulfill the need uh, for the new market requirements? Look, I don't care about the market. So <laughs> I, I, don't, I also don't care to fulfill it. I, I think the market is problematic. Uh, I, I think that the schools uh, uh, are, are not here to fulfill market requirements. We are here to advance knowledge within the discipline and produce new markets, new ways of working, and new ways of collaboration uh, that if anything, the market doesn't yet have. To the extent that we prepare students for the workplace, uh, we, we prepare them to overcompensate, to do more than what the marketplace is asking for. And uh, their excellence in the realm of exploration, experimentation, uh, failing and risking and representing with eloquence is part of that task. But the latter discussion that we had about critical judgment is a second part of that. The chances are that in five to 10 years, uh, as Omar suggested, all of the techniques that you and I have learned will become obsolete. But our experience and our critical judgment and our openness to learn will never become obsolete. So we should try not to prepare them for the workplace or the market that we know now. We should, we should prepare them for uncertainty and for a world that is yet to exist. Makes perfect sense. Um, now we'll take it from Omar. You have another question? Okay, so um, I think we're going to have some of the audiences. We have some questions, I believe. Okay, just a minute. Okay, so here's the question from the audience. 
if you want to give an advice to the students of architecture in Amman, what would it be? I don't know the circumstances in, in Amman well enough. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not, um, I, I have been to Amman and I had a, a wonderful trip there. Uh, it was brief, uh, it was intimate, uh, and it was, uh, you know, indicative of the best of circumstances I could uh, ever imagine. But uh, I, I guess if spoken as an outsider, uh, uh, I would go back to the question of where you think Amman is in the context of a global conversation and its assessment of its place within its own history and its own culture. To the extent that we are all learning and knowing that there is no such thing as only local, we've seen the way in which the pandemic has been able to communicate across borders, regions, and people, races and, and species in some instances, uh, that uh, we know we are one. And so the, the production of architectural knowledge, uh, the debates that we share uh, have no borders and that uh, for those students who are entering into this conversation, uh, they should know that their literature uh, and their debates may not be that different than, than mine or my neighbors in Boston or New York. At the same time, I like to believe uh, as an Iranian or as an Iranian American, that there are particular and specific modes of thinking that are not reducible to the canons produced by the West. Right now, we're seeing a very interesting upheaval uh, in the United States that's defined by the killing of a few people, uh, George Floyd amongst many others. They're not a few actually. If you look at them over the 400 years of enslavement, they are in the thousands, if anything, maybe the hundreds and thousands. But for me, they are also indicative of a mode of education and thinking that has run along colonial models, such that different mentalities, uh, different ways of thinking and different histories have been marginalized in that process. So I would ask you, uh, as people of the Middle East, uh, as uh, the diversity of communities from which you come, what are the different mentalities, techniques, and histories that you bring to this game that challenge the very canons of Western doctrine that tend to um, model our conversations today. To the extent that uh, I brought in conversations about uh, the Seljuk period and the Safavid period, it had to do with an ignorance in my own education because we were never taught that. And so during my thesis year, I was forced to project onto that a Western theory that would help me absorb and understand it. I still to this day don't know if I've interpreted it correctly, but I understand the necessity to, to build new forms of knowledge outside of those canons. Uh, you will have to do the same. Yeah, of course. I think that uh, especially in education, this cross-cultural thing should be something to be teached at every university or school. People should know about other cultures all around and to form some sort of platform that connects everyone together so people can stay connected. I think this pandemic has uh, shown us so many examples that we all at our homes started to notice the problems of the people around us and what they are going through, either from uh, war, war zones or health problems, 
people who are still living in slums and what actions should we take. I believe that everyone should have a general role or a more of an international role, wherever he was or she was at their own space, they should be involved in such scenarios and come up with solutions depends on their background or their major. Uh, so I believe, for example, for us as architects, I don't think it's a right thing that even now in 2020, we still put uh, people uh, who come from uh, other countries such as refugees in tents. I believe that maybe we should start coming up with new solutions to provide that, let's say, temporary shelter in a more humane way rather than just a tent. People should look at these uh, subjects and think of it more to be more a productive person in their own uh, country. Okay, uh, Russia, you have a question. Okay, um, which is I'm kind of overwhelmed with all the information that was told in this uh, presentation. I kind of have a little small question about the background, the virtual background you display. <laughs> Yes. Is it the, a project the, of yours? Um, uh, no, it is not. Uh, the, 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 the background is the ceiling, the roof, excuse me, the ceiling, the vault in mm -hmm. the town hall in the French uh, town of Arles, A-R-L-E-S. And it is the historical moment when the advent of descriptive geometry comes into confrontation with the problems of construction. If you look carefully at the joinery of these moments right here, you mm -hmm. see that the line of the geometry cannot resolve itself with the overlap of the stacking of stone. And because of that, it shows some of the fundamental challenges of dealing with the discipline and, and and disciplinary problematics. Uh, and so uh, for me, this is a brilliant illustration of architectural problems that don't reconcile, but that come into conflict. Uh, and it is that conflict that I wish uh, to discuss during this lecture. Okay. And remember that this, the geometry of this ceiling is not nature. It is a moment of invention where descriptive geometry swoops in as a discipline and defines the way that architects are working. Mm -hmm. Thank you for presentations. Thank you. Now Thank we you. give it to Mohammed, the host. This has been a lovely, informative lecture, but unfortunately, our time is up. Nader, we would like to thank you for uh, your time uh, and the opportunity. We'd love to have you again sometimes. Hopefully next time we will meet in person. Uh, thank you hey. all for watching. Stay tuned for more lectures and be sure to follow us on our social media accounts. We are Arknot team and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much again. So much. And uh, oh, we hope that next time you come in Jordan, we can get to meet you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.